Hello. Hello. Are we are we on mute? We're not on mute. We're, no, not, we're on not on mute. mute. We're not on mute. We're here. We're a little bit different this time around. Is it a Friday? It's not. It's a Thursday. It's a Thursday. In the middle of the month. Wow. Yes. Yes. Welcome to uh whoa. What, 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 Unbottled. What are we doing? What are we doing? Into Unbottled. the wine aisle. That's it. Wine aisle hacks. Wine That's what we're doing. Aisle hacks. That's, That's what it. we're doing. No, welcome to Unbottled. This is uh, our kind of new bring your own uh, wine tasting. Let's just check. That, you know, we're not. Sometimes the phone goes and it's messages from people saying you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> you can't see yeah. it. No, but it, apparently we're all good. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is our brand new bring your own uh, bottle wine tasting, where we are joined by our man in the field. Smash Grapes wine writer, Smash Grapes wine writer, consumer wine expert, exactly. Justin Sims. Here he is. Say, Say hello, hello. Justin. Hello. Hi, guys. So yes, Justin is uh, the wine nerd, as he is affectionately known. Um, but uh, he, we, well, we set him a bit of a task, mm. didn't we? And this is how the kind of the unbottled wine aisle hacks as a concept as is going to work as a format. Yep. Tell the people how it's going to work. So we know all too well that you guys at home have got big brand familiar favorites. We do too. You know, those classic brands that you reach for on the supermarket shelves time and time again. Nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely fine. There's a reason they're, you know, best in class or most known in class. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But we decided to set Justin here a challenge to take one of those brand favorites and go out into the high street and find three fantastic alternatives that either offer better, well, in fact, always offer better value for money, but also most likely offer a bit more taste as well. So something a little bit more interesting, a bit different, or just a fantastic value alternative. This month, month, week, how often are we going to do this? We haven't really set that out. Well, this, this, this time, this segment, this, this time, episode, we this have one. chosen Oyster Bay Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Uh, so, yeah, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. We talk about it a lot in our other tastings. Super popular at the moment. So, we tasked Justin to find three alternatives to possibly the nation's favourite New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. But before we get into Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Justin, do you want to tell people at home a little bit about yourself and a bit about what you do? That's it. Sure. So um, basically, I am now a content writer. Um, I um, specialize in wine. Wine's been my specialized subject now for ooh, well over 20 years. I'm not going to be too specific. Don't want to give me any. Um, um, basically, after spending uh, quite a considerable amount of time um, selling the stuff, I thought uh, actually it would be quite nice to write about it. So. COVID actually gave me a bit of an opportunity to uh, have a rethink and um, yeah, haven't, thankfully haven't looked back. So uh... writing for us for a while now. So anybody that's yes. had a copy of Wine Matter in any of their orders uh, will have seen articles written by Justin. Uh, Justin, you're, you're someone I've known and worked with for quite a while now. Um, and you're the sort of guy that I go to for a bit of wine knowledge. Yeah. Your uh, Instagram uh, handle is at wine nerd. Tell me, what is the difference between a wine nerd and a wine snob? What's the difference? Uh, that's a good question. Um, okay, so uh, in my opinion, a wine nerd is somebody who has a big interest in wine, like myself, um, but I'm interested from the point of view of enjoying it and drinking it. I don't really want to analyse it too much, although obviously I'll research it. Um, I certainly don't want to bore people, um, you know, bore the pants off people by telling them exactly how it's made and so on. Um, basically, yeah, uh, a wine snob is somebody who's probably looks after their wine, spends more time looking at it, nurturing it, rather than actually yeah. drinking it. Cuddling, cuddling, cuddling wine, wine bottles. Cuddling yeah, the not, bottles. Not the style. Not the style. <laughs> we're after. the bottles. Uh, yeah, so uh, no, I'm not into that. Yeah, um, and it's probably safe to say, isn't it, that even somebody who knows as much about wine as you do, you still want a bargain, don't you, at the end of the day? Like, you're not going to the okay. poshest places all the time to buy wine. You're not sloshing back £20 a bottle on a Tuesday night with your spag bulb. Anyways, you still want to find value, don't you, even though you, you know, you've got a big knowledge of wine. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and actually, sometimes nothing gives me more pleasure than finding an absolute steal um, that you just stumble across, you pick it up, you try it, and you say, Jesus, 
how on earth did I, you know, how on earth did I come across that? That's amazing. And then bang, it will end up on um, Instagram or whatever. So, um, yeah. I like it. I like it. Cool. Well, um, you know, if you, you, you're watching this, you may be watching it live. You might be watching it back in the future. We're going to be going over, like Sam said, uh, some of the, the best known wines around. And this one is all about the Oyster Bay Sauvignon Blanc. Where from, do, New Zealand. from New Zealand. Where, are we, uh, where do we get these ones from? Uh, Oyster Bay we found in Tesco's, didn't we? It was a tenner yep. in Tesco's. Um, yep. It sort of varies around that price point. New Zealand Sauvignon, just in, it can go as low as what? seven or eight maybe maybe but it's generally around the 10 pound point what is it that makes new zealand sauvignon and this particular one a sort of premium favorite at the moment in the uk well we've obviously been pretty um uh i, I use the word obsessed with um sauvignon especially marlborough um Mar marlborough's where it kicked it all off um we're going back to the sort of late 80s early 90s and um it basically gives that big kind of fruit bomb thing that uh, people love. You know, it's refreshing. It's a nice crisp glass of wine, bags of fruit. And um, yeah, it's basically what people are looking for. Just so didn't turn um, his phone on silent. Didn't turn his phone on silent. No. I, thought we were, I thought we were working <laughs> with professionals here. You know, no, cool. Well, you know, obviously, uh, if you're watching, uh, you're watching this back, maybe you're not uh, an Oyster Bay drinker. Uh, regularly but you've got another Sauvignon Blanc that you normally go to drop a message in the comments would love to know kind of what's your go-to from the shops equally if there's a wine maybe that you know doesn't necessarily need to be a Sauvignon Blanc if there's a wine in a supermarket that you're like you've got to try this mm, it's you know me. it's your it's your recommendation put it in the comments let us know we'd love to uh, love to see what you're drinking on the regular okay so before we move on to what you picked Justin yeah. Talked about Sauvignon Blanc being a f f firm favourite because of the fruit bomb. Um, also, I think Sauvignon for me is popular at the moment because of the refreshment factor. If we get mm -hmm. down into the nitty gritty, we talk about this when we do our tribe before you buy tastings, when we talk about wines, grapes and climate and what it is that makes wine A, fruity and, and B, refreshing. What is it about Sauvignon Blanc that, and the, maybe the climate that it grows in in New Zealand that A, gives you the refreshment and B, gives you the fruit? So, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Sam. It is, but it's primarily here climate. So uh, in New Zealand, we're talking um, relatively cool climate. Um, you know, we're not talking about extreme temperatures in the summer, um, but there's a big kind of uh, maritime influence here. You're getting a lot of um, coastal breezes coming off. Um, it keeps the vineyards cool. Um, Sauvignon basically likes to be in a cool climate environment. Um, and that's where you get these really pronounced acids um, so you know we talk about acidity um, these wines naturally have this high level of acid and acid acidity is basically the effect that makes your mouth water so um, you know you yeah, take a mouthful of this um, I, I always struggle with the whole like concept of acid because you know I don't want to be I don't drink acid do you but it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound thing. like it's something to appeal in but actually it's what most people would class as dry isn't it yeah i guess yeah i mean dryness we've talked about before is actually yeah. to do with sugar and how sweet or dry wine like pretty much all of the wines we drink on a day-to-day -day basis are dry unless you're having a dessert wine but it's, it's quite common isn't it justin like dan says for people to interpret acidity as the dryness because it gives the refreshment factor or the crispness to the wine yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, just taking a quick mouthful of this and, you know, it is making my mouth water, um, but it, it's, I don't know, it's slightly weird. It's feeling a slightly disconnected. Um, I don't know if uh, that probably won't make a lot of sense, but I'm getting this kind of mouth watering thing. Yep. And then I'm getting a bit of flavor as well, a little bit of a burn. And this is the one thing I find in, you might find this, Dan. That's gin and tonic for you. Yeah, that yeah. is that yeah. is that's there what is happens when burn. you drink a gin and tonic. Acid burn. Yeah, I do think this. We're going to talk later, aren't we? Probably about balance in yeah. a white wine and the balance between yeah. the acidity and the sugar. And I think, I think that'll end up being a theme of you know the wines tonight. And I think you're right. It's a bit unbalanced. The acid, the acidity in this. They've gone. We want to make it refreshing. We want to deliver the lip smacking expectations yeah. that customers have for so Sauvignon Blanc. And actually, I just don't. I think it's a bit too much, isn't it? It's a bit burny for me personally. 
Yeah, I've, I've interesting. I've, I've become very um, susceptible to acidity, a bit like you, Dan, as well. I don't like really high acid, or if it is there, I need it to be in balance. I don't want to feel the burn in, in the back of my throat. Um, and unfortunately, some, um, particularly in New Zealand, some of the big brands um, <clears throat> do give you that kind of quite aggressive acidity, that acid burn that you, you, you find in the back of the throat. Um, sometimes I found this in uh, some of the lower priced supermarket wines where they might acidify the wine. Um, so they'll be adding um, extra tartaric acid um, during the winemaking process. It's perfectly legitimate, but the problem is it's not natural and it can be quite aggressive. So it gives you that real burn in the back of the throat. Um, We've touched on that a few times, the whole like the fact that there's so many things that can go into wine that don't need to go on a label. Perfectly um, legitimate. Legi but, but, yeah, and the, yeah. you know, they all have reasons for going yeah. in. Um, and it's just the sulfites that have to go on the label. But mm. actually, sometimes yeah. it tends to be kind of your mass acids market, lower sugar. brand yeah. acids and sugars. And they can uh, they can really give you a bit of that bit of that burn and probably a bit of a thick head as well. Yeah, well, I find, oh, that's what I was going to say. I, I actually had a bottle of this uh, earlier in the week. To, to, to remind myself of Oyster Bay. Didn't need a whole bottle then, did you? No, I don't suppose not. But, you <laughs> hard. Know, you I actually it? only had two thirds of it, all right? So just back <laughs> off. But <laughs> the other I, third yeah, went in the food. Whenever I, I do have <laughs> uh, big brand white wines um, that could possibly, you know, we don't want to accuse anyone of anything, um, be using like acid powders and stuff like that, I'm worse the next day for it. I, I, mm. I felt that the next day. For it like I did feel I felt a little bit rougher and I do think yeah. you know when the wines aren't getting their acidity naturally balanced in the vineyard when it's happening after the grapes have been picked and it's happening in, in production with added sugar or added acid but personally I that's what I feel the next morning that's what makes me feel ropey you know so that will give you a little bit of a summary over like mm. what we've felt with oyster bay so this is you know we know this is a this is a big hit it's a big favorite at home 1050 you know it's not it's not a cheap wine mm -mm. you know um so the way that on uh, unbottled is going to work is we we kind of said to justin look here's a favorite go and find us some other things that are out there in the supermarket that you think deliver the same if not better experience and a bit more bang for your buck so you have sent us three wines that we've mm -hmm. got here in front of us we haven't opened them yet. We haven't tried them. No, we haven't tried we, them. I'm familiar with some of them, but I've not yeah. tried these particular ones. Um, so look, we've got three in front of us. Let's go with uh, let's go with number one. Justin, what uh, what was your first find for wine number one? So first find is a South African Sauvignon Blanc. So sticking with the Sauvignon theme, um, this is a an estate called Vergelagen. Um, very, very well um, regarded estate, um, gets top ratings. Um, and this is their kind of benchmark Sauvignon Blanc. Now, you might be wondering, Sauvignon, South Africa, surely it's quite hot. You know, we're talking about cool climate. Well, actually, there are a lot of cooler climate sites in the Cape as well, um, especially when you get up into the mountains, like um, in the Helderberg, where this is, uh, wine has come from. Um, so it's on the outskirts of Stellenbosch, but it's elevated. Um, so you'll find that the um, altitude and also the um, exposure to some more of the kind of coastal influence that comes off um, the Southern Ocean, um, uh, Indian Ocean makes a big difference here as well and just keeps those burning temperatures down. Um, like th so this is like something that like blew my mind when we first started doing tastings mm. is obviously fruit. If you think about fruit, it needs sunshine to go yeah. nice and ripe. Mm. but it also it, at night it wants to be cold yes what's the technical word for that justin hot in the day cold at night do you want a, a broad diurnal difference diurnal, diurnal difference. difference there you go yeah they like it warm in the day and cold at night don't they? and that again is to create exactly. balance isn't it yeah and you're, what you're trying to do is you want to slow down the ripening so when it cools down you you basically you're trying to get your grapes um phenolically ripe um, physiologically ripe. Phenolically. Phenolically. <laughs> Phenolically. <laughs> nice. Nice. Big words coming up here. Yeah. yeah have you will get the, some... have to put the subtitles on. Okay. But yeah, you want you want your grapes to be to, to ripen slowly, is what we're saying. 
you want them to ripen slowly. So you want them to develop all the, the natural characteristics. So they're all in balance. Again, you'll be hearing, you know, talking about balance. And um, it's really important that these vines um, are able to sort of uh, balance themselves out during the daytime. Um, so they're not exposed to these extremes of temperature. Um, and, and that way the grape will uh, ripen, um, you know, it'll be balanced basically as the grapes ripen. So you'll have this sort of sugar and acid level will both kind of mirror each other. And you're trying to keep them as kind of um, as equal as possible. So where do we pick this, uh, the, the Leggett? Uh, co-op, we got it from co-op, co but it's at yeah. Tesco's as Tesco's well. Tesco's and co-op. And yeah. this is, this is yep. a tenner. This is a tenner yeah, still. So this is, this is still at that kind of top end with, with the Oyster Bay. As well, yeah. Um, but South Africa do do yeah. premium wine really well, don't they? And this is by no yeah. means premium for them. They go they go right up there, don't they? In terms, of oh like, yeah, even with Sauvignon or, or other grape varieties. We should probably have a drink of this. That's oh yeah, we're saying, yeah. We haven't. Um, yeah, right. We've we've had a comment come in as well about that. James is a fan of the I Heart Sauvignon. Now they do a whole range, don't they? Mm. Heart. Uh, I don't know anything about it other than they do a range, and I get I see it a lot in garages. Yeah, I heart. I'm guessing they source different grapes from different countries, don't they? They're not all based in one country. I heart. I don't think they do a prosecco. I, think, I know that. Mm. I think the idea behind the concept, well, certainly in terms of the um, uh, the varietal wines, is that they probably can source. You know, they can chop and change the source. They don't have to stick to the same producer. Um, so it gives them flexibility, basically, to maintain a price point and and so on. And that's not uncommon. And you, uh, when we were, you were talking about the Vergelag in here, you said estate-grown fruit. That's kind of that's on a similar subject, isn't it? What what does that mean in terms of estate-grown fruit? So basically, when you're talking about very big brands, quite often there will be um, some of the fruit they'll grow themselves, but a lot of it they'll actually be buying in from long-term contracts. Uh, they'll have contracts set up with growers, basically for grape farmers. Um, these guys, so the fruit that goes into this wine is all coming from their own estate, from their own property vineyards. So they're not buying in any fruit. So they have complete control. Um, they oversee the quality, can't they? They can make sure yeah. that it's up to scratch. I mean, of course, they will have quality control when they source grapes elsewhere, but it's not quite at the same yeah. level, is it really? No, um, um, but what it also does, it gives you provenance as well. So, you know, a lot of people are talking about provenance with like food. Yeah. You know, we're all getting quite, um, you know, it's quite important to us. We know where our food comes from and it's yeah. the same thing with the wine as well. So, you know, the provenance, you, it, you know exactly where this um, fruit is coming from. Yeah. Um, it's coming from the same source year in, year out. Um, so, yeah, it's, I think it's probably a good peace of mind. It's, not, it's, it's always a good... Um, reassure for the consumer mm -hmm. it's not giving me that kind of acid burn acid burn is lower yeah, for me acid. but also i don't think it's got yeah. i think the it's not as it's not the fruit bomb it's not fruit, um, no, either it's not i think fruit. the fruits are a little bit like cleaner for me there's not yeah like, what do you mean you you use clean a lot you have said clean a lot is it well, like <laughs> clean are you is expecting just like, like a muddy flavor like, what, no, what just, yeah well just not lots of fruits just like you know maybe yeah, okay. one fruit just yeah. a straight fruit flavor like a lemon or a lime or something yeah. like that there's not like not absolutely muddy. tons yeah whereas like new zealand yeah. sauvignon for me can be a bit of a fruit salad really can't it it's just like loads of different stuff going on all at the same time yeah yeah, yeah. i mean yeah i'd definitely go with that it's nice uh -huh. it is nice it's i say it I would drink. I would rather drink that than the Oyster Bay. Is that just because you went to South Africa once? <laughs> well, I'm yeah, surprised you haven't mentioned. It. <laughs> I, wasn't, I mean, I wasn't even. I wasn't even going to go there. But, uh, but no, no. I, the the Oyster Bay was a bit burning. I just this is nice, but I don't think it's ten quid nice. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think I think I would rather drink it than the Oyster Bay. So I think it is ten quid nice mm. for sure. Yeah, I think. Mm. Uh, I like it. If I was going to drink Sauvignon, I'd, I'd rather have that than the oyster so far. I mean, so we'll see what's going on. Yeah, we've got a few more yeah, to try. So. More to try. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. 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 So, what, like, I mean, is, is, is there a lot of Sauvignon Blanc out there from, from uh, South Africa? Get a lot of it? Or is it, you know, we, we've obviously we, we've seen stuff like um, an Italian, we've, we've had like an Italian Sauvignon Blanc, which is yep. pretty rare for Italy. Yeah. Like, how. You know, you, I don't you, know. you How, get a lot of shenny. Yeah, yeah. What is what does what do you reckon Sauvignon Blanc makes up of white wine output? Quite a bit, I imagine, for South Africa. 
Yeah, it's it's one of the more popular grape varieties. Um, in fact, I, I'd almost go so far as saying it might be considered one of their heritage grapes as well, like Chenin, mm. uh, like Chenin Blanc and uh, Semillon as well. Um, so Sauvignon, I think, has been established in in the Cape for a long, long time. Um, and yeah, there's certainly plenty of, uh, of of examples from you know cheapest chips all the way up to sort of very serious almost like white Bordeaux lookalikes. Mm, mm. um, and South Africa is a bit of an unusual region, isn't it really? Because it kind of sits somewhere between new world and old world. I mean, we class it as a yeah. new world wine region like Chile or California or Australia or New Zealand in the sense that, you know, the Romans didn't take grapes there and like, you know, like in the rest of Europe. Yeah. But it's actually had grape growing for like the best part of, I don't know, five, 600 years now. And it goes right back to the 1600s, doesn't it? So that's not five, 600 years. That's like 400 or so. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. it's, it's had wine a lot longer than the rest. So it, it kind of makes the, the wine landscape a little bit different to the new world countries, doesn't it? Yeah, it, I mean, it's, interestingly, it's kind of, there's a similar story to a lot of the so-called new world countries as well. Um, but I mean, if you talk about the sort of modern style of winemaking, yeah, South Africa has certainly been making wine for yeah, centuries now. Um, it's very, very well established. Um, and sure, I mean, a lot of the styles probably look a lot more European than they do, um, you know, South American for, for sake of argument or mm. Australasian or whatever. They like they like um a, like a blend like the French don't they you know you find a lot of Rhone yeah. blend or Bordeaux blend and stuff like that They're, whereas like we might associate New World with like Chilean Merlot Chilean Sauvignon Blanc you know single varietals in the bottle uh, yeah. South Africa they do a lot of sort of more the old school blends don't they here's one for yeah. you is yeah. do the Dutch make wine uh, there, is there any Dutch wine well the Dutch founded South African well, that's what I'm saying. No, well, that's what Simon I'm saying. van der Stel. Yeah. He was, he's the guy at Stellenbosch. So well. do you reckon that they just they couldn't, they don't do a lot of winemaking in the Netherlands? Found South Africa and were just like, let's yep. just go for it. Let's go for it here. Because I don't think I've ever tried a Dutch wine. No, I don't know Dutch if they do. Wine. It was um, when they first rocked up. It was sweet wine, wasn't it? When the Dutch first rocked yeah. up in South Africa. It has a name beginning with C. I can't think what it's called. Yeah, um, Constantia. Constantia, that's it, yeah. Well, the van, van der Constance. Mm. But you also got to remember there was a lot of French. So there's a big French um, influence uh, as well in the early the early part of the um, South African industry. You had all the French Huguenots basically came over, and and I think they were the ones who pretty much set up all the vineyards. Um, uh, maybe they were overseen by the Dutch, um, but it was certainly the French who had a big. You know, Dutch if you think overlords, that's uh... <laughs> French overlords. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, I think, mean, look, I, I like it. It's nice. Co -op, but was there a deal in Tesco on this one? Uh, no, we paid no. we paid a tenner. Okay, yeah, right, right. full price. And you know, and obviously, you might see it on a on a discount or something. But uh, but no, I mean, look, I I think I would prefer to drink it to Oyster Bay, but it's but, not tickled your fancy. But whether I, as an everyday wine drinker, I mean, let's be honest, you know, I'm not an everyday white wine drinker. No, whether I would go for it. The jury is currently out. Shall we move on? Yes. So, Justin, <laughs> what have you got for us next? Come on, let's, uh, let, let, let's okay. see what's, what's up next. Okay, so next we're going to go to Western Australia. And we've got um, the Mad Fish Sauvignon Blanc. So we're, st again, sticking with the Sauvignon theme here. Same grape variety. Um, now, Western Australia, uh, very different, apart from the fact that it's incredibly remote, uh, versus the rest of um, uh, of Australia, um, we're we're in a very remote corner, if you like, and um, you've got a massive. Uh, again, we're talking about climate. Um, everyone thinks Australia. Oh God, that's you know, it's a ridiculously hot country. It's you know, desert. Most of it's desert. Sure, it is. But actually, if you get right down into the southern, um, uh, basically along the southern belt of Australia. Um, where you've got the exposure to the, um, the oceans um, and also obviously the Antarctic, the next, next stop if you head further south. Um, you know, we've got some very, very cool climate influence and uh, none more so here than in Western Australia. So Sauvignon Blanc actually does very, very well here. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised to see 
an Australian one as one of your picks? Because, I mean, certainly at Smash Grapes, when we talk about Australian wines, generally we're going for big, bolshy Shirazes, big, heavy Chardonnay, that sort mm. of thing. So, yeah, to see what we're, what we're classing as a cool climate varietal from, from Australia, I was quite surprised, actually. I mean, I, I'm all in on this. Oh, you like it? You've already decided? Uh, yeah? Well, no, no <laughs> I haven't decided. Either. I've, got, I've got to try number three first, but... <laughs> yeah, I like this. I like this. This is, um, yeah, it's nice. It's nice. It, it, I can I can see this. Obviously, for me, it's all about situation. White wine for me is, you know, barbecue, sat in the garden, you know, few people around, sunshine, sun mm. hitting me. That that's when I think a white wine comes into its own, and I can. I mean, it takes me there. Mm. I can close my eyes and I'm there. I think the acidity's come down on this, and that might be yeah. because it's perhaps slightly warmer <laughs> than where you would normally go for Sauvignon Blanc. The, one, the question I want to ask, Justin, yeah. for me, Australia is one of those countries where unless you go right at the real premium end, like 20, 30 pound a bottle, it just seems yeah. to be dominated by big brands. Is that just because it's a big country? Have I got that completely wrong? Like Madfish, for me, I know it's not... It's not uh, Julio Gallo or anything, but it still feels like quite a substantial brand to me. Or is that not the tr not the case? Well, so I don't know how big this brand has become now. I suspect it's fairly big, um, but it's still owned by a a, a family. It's a family concern. Um, I think it's the Birch family who own um, a, the premium label is Howard Park. Um, okay. Now, if you look at Howard Park. You know, we're talking sort of top kind of Langton classification, which is the Australian, um, I suppose it's the Australians um, equivalent of rating all the best wineries um, around the country. Um, Howard Park is one of those real super premium wines that's well known around the world. You get served in all the top restaurants. Um, but this is their kind of, um, uh, I don't know, the everyday drinking brand, if you like. Um, so sure, it has become successful. It's, it's grown a lot um, since it was first launched in 92, I think was the first vintage. Um, but Which doesn't it, make it, it very old as a wine, does it? That's pretty young. A winery. It's a winery, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty, pretty, yeah. Young. pretty, pretty young. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. For sure, for sure. Um, but, you know, there again... The, I believe their winemaker now, their, their winemaker, um, that's, um, I think it's just on the little neck label. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, winemaker of the year. Yeah. 2018. Apparently she had just moved on. She'd been with them a long, long time. Um, she just moved on, I think, last November. Um, so they've got a new head winemaker. But, um, you know, basically she's put them on the map. Um, they pick up lots of awards. And for me, this one stood out because... It was pretty bloody good value, really. Yeah, I mean, we got this seven quid yeah. with a club card. Yep, ten down to seven. It's quite. They've got you, haven't they? Uh, they've, club card. they've got you. Yeah. This just shows you that in the yeah. world we yeah. live in, data is king. Because yeah. the only reason they want they want your email address. Yeah, man. You can, can get it. if you give them your email address, you can get Pringles for a pound. My Pringles, <laughs> Pringles, an entire tube for one pound. Yeah. Who who wouldn't give over a it's, little bit of their soul? It's becoming a bit of a habit of mine to when I hit the wine aisle at Tesco's to look for those yellow circles for sure. Yeah, and I mean, but think they've got a bit of power there, though, haven't they? Like they could they could be like we're trying to do, like broadening people's horizons because people will buy a deal. Oh, like, shit, they will buy a deal. Tesco's Always. know what they're doing. Oh, I've just told them. I've told them <laughs> their. Uh, told them the plan. <laughs> so it's yeah. quite it's quite common, isn't it, Justin? Actually, to have a big not big, but like premium, well-established, world-famous uh, winery do uh, a sort of day-to-day -day drinking wine as well. What, you know, why, why, do they, why, do they, why do they even bother with that? Like, is there, is there just maybe more money in having the cheaper wine as well as the premium stuff? Or is it just sort of spreading, uh, spreading their chips, essentially? Because like it's quite common, isn't it? Yeah, it is quite common. Um, I mean, the thing is, with... Um with winemaking, uh, with producing wine, it's about economies of scale. It's like any business, um, it's economies of scale. And, um, you know, you can't, you can have a small boutique winery, um, but, you know, you're gonna have to sell your wine at very high prices um, to be able to sort of break even. It's a very expensive business to get into. Um, most people who I think go into um, setting up wineries are basically trying to get rid of money. 
Um, <laughs> you know, you don't generally make money for a long time. You know, uh, you know there are a few exceptions, um, but you've got to be very lucky. So you need a cash cow. And basically these wines um, end up becoming the cash cow that ends up financing the, um, the premium stuff. Um, Finance is the pet project. So the, that, you know, the, the art. Yeah, the, yeah, art. the art. They want you know, yeah. put it all in, all the craft into these, bo- you know, this particular strain of bottles. And, but it does yeah. mean you get, um, it does mean you get really good quality wines. I can think, well, yeah, of, a, I can think of a few yeah. wineries. I think of the South African Waterclue, for example. They make fantastic premium South African wine, but their entry level stuff that you can get for like seven ninety nine is good. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's been made by the same person, yeah. so there's obviously going to be a bit of care and attention because yeah. that's just in their blood to to have that care and attention. So it's probably something to look out for, isn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think as well. You know, tends to be something from. I think only people in the know would mm. would would even put would would know that Madfish is part of yeah that. have a part yeah you know you. So they, and I think they, I think for for obvious reasons they keep the the, the ties quite separate mm. because you you know you don't want to walk into a room and be like oh selling X Y Z with this that and the other prestige and they go you knock out a million bottles of Madfish mate don't come yeah, talk to me about true. prestige so they, I think for everyday consumer on the, on the wine aisle it's mm. probably um, I'd be interested to see you know anyone who's uh, kind of your 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 watching what you know where awesome. else are you getting or listening. Where else you're getting Sauvignon Blanc from? Obviously, we yeah. know um, France, obviously the spiritual home and genetic home, I guess, of, of Sauvignon Blanc. But where else? Where oh, else in the world are oh, you drinking? Country? I thought you meant shop. Well, I, I mean, thought you were calling for like shout outs. For, well, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, where in the world are you drinking it? We've gone, we've gone from New Zealand to South Africa to um, Australia, Australia here. Um, but you know, where else are you drinking it? Yeah, and where are you buying it from? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Send, put us a little comment in. Let yeah, leave us a where comment. you're buying. Absolutely. And if anybody wants to comment any questions, uh, please do so. And if we don't pick them up because it's you're not listening or watching live, then we'll pick them up on the next one. Here's a, here's one for you, Justin. It's just popped into my head whilst I was looking at the uh, little award label there for Janice McDonald. What's your opinion on wine awards? Those little gold stickers that sit on the bottles. Are they worth reading into? Can you take them? Um, you know, should you take? A- what do you see? I've started seeing in uh, in Aldi. There's a number-based one, isn't it? Is it decanter points or well, is it James a, points? I'll let Justin explain points. There's probably <laughs> no, but there, lots of people give points, but they don't all give it on the same. They don't all apply the same rules, do they, Justin? No, I think you have to. Um, sometimes you have to take a little bit with a pinch of salt. Um, they are useful. Um, so, for example, if we're talking about things like um, the International Wine and Spirit Competition (IWSC) is a big one that we have in the UK probably the biggest one um the iwsc is pretty um is pretty fair it has a big panel of uh, judges um so it's a good spread it's um you know i think it's uh they're, they're pretty valid and they're a good indicator um the decanter uh decanter wines also do um they have a fairly big panel um I think sometimes you just have to be a little bit, you have to take them slightly at face value. Um, Some of the competitions you have to pay to enter. So a lot of importers, for example, won't put their wines forward specifically because they have to pay to put their wines forward and submit all the samples. So it's, um, you know, it's not always representative of the complete set of wines that are out there, but it still gives you a good indication of those that have actually put wines forward Sure, it does give you um, some kind of benchmark. So yeah, but I think points, um, points get, like I mean, there are decanter points, and decanter is a is a magazine, online magazine. Mm-hmm. But there is also like James Sucklin points and um, yep. stuff like that. That's re- That's just an individual, or is it? Is it just that individual's opinion, or you know, I think it depends um, on the organisation, maybe. It depends on the organisation. Um, I mean, you know, if you're talking about um, the wine advocate, like Robert Parker, for example, robertparker.com. I mean, obviously, Robert Parker's retired now. So um, you get basically a, uh, a panel of uh, tasters um, who work for robertparker.com. Um, and they will actually put their initials. So it's quite useful. You do know, actually, who's tasting those wines. And, you, you know, if you follow these guys, I mean, these are all pre-accomplished tasters. They're all good leading authorities. 
Um, so I think a lot of these guys are well worth, you know, they do know what they're talking about. Yeah, I just find though with some of these, like when you, when you do, it's, it's a bit, it comes down to, it's a bit like food, right? Mm. So, you know, I consider myself an everyday drinker. Yeah. Mm. So what, what someone who is well trained in the art of wine thinks is, is excellent in a, in a, you know, in a wine might not be what I just want in an everyday. So their high mark for quality and, you know, tertiary flavors and all this and, and, mm. and complexity might not be the kind of thing I'm yeah, looking but they're not, for. They're not scoring it. Um, based on the same scale, so they would score Madfish not by, compared to you know the most premium white Burgundy in the world. They'd say what what is this for at its price mm. point? It's for barbecue refreshment, yeah. and they'd score it for that. Like for example, Yancis Robinson uh, is a you know well world renowned critic, and she does points, and she's she's done scores for some of the wines we have on store, like the Thistle Down, um, gorgeous Grenache and stuff like that. And she scored it highly for the fact that it's easy drinking red, not because it's the most complex and beautiful red she's ever drunk. Yeah, so yeah, they, I think I'm right in saying, Justin, they score it based on what it was intended for, don't they, rather than all on the yeah. same scale? They, yeah, and they basically take it um, for what it is. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll score it within the context of what it is and what it's for. Um, so you're absolutely right. You know, they're not going to score it against, you know, the top, first growth Bordeaux or whatever and say yeah you can't do it you can't really do it like that it's based on you know is it a good wine of its type at its price um yeah, and it just, it just, remember, it just concerns me yeah. that some of these people are just beyond my comprehension of wine you know like I don't you know I'm not interested in you know when it comes to food like you know yuzu gels and leaves of this and that <laughs> I just want steak and chips do you mm. know what I mean because it's a Tuesday night but I think there are some, if we take the food critic example, yeah. there are some food critics that judge restaurants like, okay, if it's not three Michelin stars, it's not worth it. But then there are also food critics that will write up restaurant Gordon Ramsay one week, but then also write up a burger bar the next week, mm. won't they? Because yeah. they understand that each has a different purpose. Yeah, so I think, I think the point we're landing on here is that awards are worth something but it's really hard to navigate which which are worth which. I don't think it's something you should rely on. Yeah, don't yeah. rely on it. Yeah, yeah, don't rely on it. Um, <clears throat> it's just interesting as well. We've obviously gone, we've gone New Zealand, we've gone South Africa, we've gone Australia. Um, and, it, you know, Roger in the chat has just said they got their wine tonight. They, they got picked up a, a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, they got theirs in Waitrose and there are 16 New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. Yeah, I mean, that one blows blows my mind as well we, we had a similar conversation the other week didn't we about rioca like if you walk into yeah. my tesco's and look at spanish wine it's literally 90 percent rioca and it's about 10 different varieties and i just can't believe that the people that live around that tesco's need 10 varieties of rioca i don't i don't understand it i mean what do you reckon justin why why do we is it just you know, is it like trainers? You know, you know, just it's different brands fighting to be the top brand, whether it be Nike or Adidas or whatever. Is is there a difference between New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs? I mean, I know there are different. There's Marlborough and there's other regions, but I mean, that's got to be well, pretty intricate differences, hasn't it, for the everyday drinker? I think um, I, I always remember like talking about the supermarket shelf. Um, you know, the the proportion of the supermarket shelf represents what the consumer basically wants. So, you know, if you've got 16 Sauvignon Blancs in, on the shelf in Waitrose, that reflects basically the, what they perceive as what the consumer wants to drink. Um, now, there is going to be a difference. You know, the, there will be subtle differences between them. Um, there'll be some big differences between certain ones. Certainly, if you're looking at Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough versus Sauvignon Blanc, let's say from, um, I don't know, up in the North Island from Hawke's Bay, um, the styles will be a little bit different um, and people have their favorite brands. Um, so there are wines, there are certain wines that do very well. And obviously the supermarkets will keep those wines on the shelf if they sell. So they, you know, yeah. if they well, turn we, over, know, we know as well, people buy by label, don't they? So yeah, for sure. But you could just, I mean, I think what, what's interesting about that for me, as much as I don't like the idea that there's 16 New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs on the shelf when there's so much else out there is that, we talk a lot, don't we, about how much variety there is out there and mm. that, you know, we, we just don't want wine drinkers to get themselves stuck in a rut of having the same thing day in, day out, or maybe the same two wines their entire life. 
even if you made the decision right now that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc was the only wine for you ever, you could still actually have quite a good time trying different things and, and, and yeah. exploring, even within that one pretty small region. You know, so yeah. and then if you if you expand that out to I just want to drink Sauvignon Blanc, even that could be really interesting. Mm. There, there's variety to be had. To flip it on its head, do you think? And this is to yeah. to both of the wine experts now in my life, guys. <laughs> um, do yeah. you think that New Zealand have carved themselves into a bit of a hole? Because you know, it's like it's it's, it's interesting because you think about French wine, and you know, you've got. You've got um, Burgundy and Bordeaux and um, Provence. You've yeah. got variety, but you think about New Zealand and you think about Sauvignon Blanc. Have they have, have they kind of cornered themselves a bit? Well, I don't know. I see what Justin thinks, but I watched a thing the other day. I think it was on Netflix. It was deep in the bowels of Netflix. No, it might have been Amazon actually. Oh, there's um, some deep bowels yeah, in Amazon. Yeah, in Amazon, there's all sorts of niche stuff <laughs> yeah. uh, to yeah, watch. Real but niche. I watched a thing about. The, the growth of the New Zealand wine uh, wine industry. And what I got from it is actually Sauvignon Blanc for a lot of these winemakers is like a needs must situation because it pays the bills. But actually a lot of them are quite passionate about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, the two Burgundy grape varieties. Mm. And they want to be able to show that New Zealand can replicate, replicate I've had a bit too much, mm. the class of Burgundy. Yeah. And they're actually a bit sort of not... Not myth, because that it pays the bills, but they kind of wish that yeah, New Zealand what, was what, known what for would, other what things. What did we have in store? We had a Pinot Blanc once. We had a Pinot Blanc. We've had a, um, we've had a, we've had all sorts of New Zealand yeah. stuff that's not Sauvignon. Cause, yeah, because like what what else is New Zealand known for beyond the the Sauvignon Blanc? Like, what, Chardonnay and Pinot. Well, Justin would say yeah. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Just in yeah. cool climate varieties generally, they they absolutely smash yeah. it, don't they? Riesling yeah. stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I don't think I've had. We've had a New Zealand red. Maybe not. No, maybe no, no, maybe not. But Justin, yeah, they they don't. They're not all about Sauvignon Blanc, are they? Really? No, no. And you're absolutely right. I mean, unfortunately, they are a little bit stuck in a rut because Sauvignon is what the world wants, and you know the global demand for Sauvignon, not just here, it, it's re it's reflected all over the world. They all want Sauvignon Blanc. They all want to drink Sauvignon Blanc, and so they've got this real dilemma, you know. They don't want to keep producing Sauvignon, but you know, at the end of the day, they want to sell. They have to. They have to sell this what the uh, what the markets want. And if the markets want Sauvignon, they've got no choice. Um, but you're right. They produce. Uh, they're producing quite a bit of Chardonnay. And actually, personally, I'd much rather drink the New Zealand Chardonnay. I think they make fantastic Chardonnay. Yeah, I agree. Glass. Um, Pinot Noir. They make. Fabulous Pinot Noir as well, um, but it's a tiny percentage overall. I mean, it's growing, and that's going to make it expensive, cool. isn't it? Well, it is quite premium, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's quite yeah. That, that Pinot Blanc we got in was was, was quite expensive. Well, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't a value wine as such. You know, it, you know, it was. No. It was definitely. It was. It was eleven pound plus. From yeah, is it? Is that just down to like economies of scale, Justin? Because if, if I think mm -hmm. now. Everything I've tried from New Zealand that isn't Sauvignon Blanc, you'd, you'd class as expensive as premium. Is that just because it's in small scale? It's small scale. It's all you know boutique level, um, mm. and you know Pinot Blanc. It's likely that Pinot Blanc is not really being grown very much in Marlborough. It might be down in Central Otago, heading right down in the south. Central Otago is premium. It's like super premium. You know, this is where you're finding some of the really great Pinot Noir. Pinot Blanc, Riesling, there's really good Riesling here, Pinot Gris, you know, it's all the kind of Burgundian um, varietals um, that are doing well down here. And when we say premium, why? Is that because of land cost in those, those areas? Because the, the areas that can grow those grapes are expensive per square mile or? I, th I think it's partly the land cost. Um, I, I don't know exactly, but I think it's more the scale. You know, these are all very small scale um, estates that are producing, and they're all um, they're, they're basically like your kind of uh, Napa. If, if you want to take it and compare it with somewhere else, you take your kind of top Napa, the high echelon in Napa, where these are all little boutique wineries. You know, when little, we say Napa, we mean California. Yeah. In California. Napa, California. California. Napa Valley. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so these are very, very small scale wineries. These are almost like gar garage, you know, garage yeasts or you know, garage wineries. 
very, very small scale. They're not making big production runs. Um, so it's expensive. What, 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 it, just, just for context, I think this is actually quite, this is quite like just mind blowing to, to know, like for, for context, <clears throat> what would you consider to be a boutique winery in terms of the amount of bottles they make a year? You're asking the wrong, wrong guy there, Justin. Um, so I would say anything, I mean, again, it, it's all subjective, but. Well, okay, yeah. let's, let's ask the other side of the question. How many bottles are someone like Oyster Bay making a year, do you, would you estimate? I know it's, you know, it's tough to know, but how well, many, how many bottles? We're talking million, okay, we're in the millions of bottles millions. of Oyster Bay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A boutique, a boutique winery might typically produce 100,000 bottles total across all their wines. So it might be 20,000 bottles of something, 20,000 yeah. bottles of something else, 30,000 bottles. Because I remember we looked at this once, there's, there's a couple of hundred grapes in a bottle. Yes, yeah, a lot of grapes. It's a lot still. of grapes. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of grapes. So to, to be doing millions. Well, if you if you look at the brand, the big American brands like um, Ernest and Gallo, oh. it's like a million. It's like millions a day. It's like I'm, I mean, I'm guessing here, but it's obscene numbers. You know, yeah. it's like every time you breathe in, they've made another ten thousand bottles. Yeah. It's like it's the scale is it's on an industrial scale. Yeah, yeah. If you which in, yeah, in which it. obviously comes with you know machinery and process yeah. and all of that that mm. that maybe doesn't at some at a boutique level okay cool right so that's our uh i liked that's it our Aussie. i liked it i yeah. know why you like it the acidity has come down yeah the, i think yeah. the fruits come up though i think that it's there's more it's fruity, fruitiness yeah. there's more fruitiness than the previous two i would say even the new zealand mm. i think this is fruity i think it's a bit um it's like a honey so it's, i don't want to say sweet because we're not in sweet territory but there's a honeyed like thing to it do you know what i mean no i don't know what you mean no? but okay. but you know that, that that means nothing that means nothing just because i don't pick it up doesn't, you know because ultimately what you sense in a wine is 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 very subjective that's why we kind of we try and shy away from real strict tasting yeah notes, we don't, don't like we? to because... we don't like to commit to anything because everybody tastes differently oh, yeah one of the things just in that i we haven't touched on yet when we're talking about Sauvignon. It doesn't come up as often with Sauvignon. It comes up more often perhaps with a Chardonnay or something like that. And that's the, the, the vat that the wine is made in. So you wrote us an article about Sauvignon Blanc for Wine Matter a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, talking about that stain, stainless steel producing. I think it was New Zealand that really pioneered stainless steel wine producing, I think you said in that article. And yeah. what's, what, how does using stainless steel compared, compared to uh, a, a wooden barrel of old sort yeah. of thing? I mean, and, you know, what other options are there? Like, what, yeah. are they, what are people doing when it comes yeah. to this kind of stuff? Sure. So basically, stainless steel is a, if you think of it as a vessel, it's, um, it's non-porous. So it doesn't let, uh, basically, it won't allow any air into it. So if you want to make a wine that's... Um, let's say you want to make a white wine and you want to retain all its aromatic qualities, um, stainless steel will allow you to do that. It won't allow any air in um, and it won't allow any of the aromas basically to escape. Um, so it's, it's generally been associated with white wine making. Now, if you use an oak barrel, oak barrels are porous. Um, you know, okay, they're not gonna be dripping wine out of them, but what they do allow is something that winemakers will refer to as micro oxygenation, which That's basically another big word. Another big word. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna have to. We're gonna have to get subtitles on this. Yeah, you could have a little a, a little warning paddle that you you yeah. hold up whenever yeah. a big word comes up. It's a big word yeah. alert. Yeah. Oh, yeah. jargon alert! Jargon Mi alert! Micro yeah. oxygenation. So that, that, that is. A little bit of air. Basically little, means yeah. a little bit of air can get into the barrel yeah. and it means that the wine can oxygenate. So it allows a bit of air into the wine, allows it to breathe. Basically, it allows put an air to... on top of your bottle. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. Um, so those are the fundamental differences between those two. Um, other vessels, so concrete is something, or cement. Um, so some winemakers will be experimenting with, particularly now, it's becoming very fashionable to use things like concrete eggs, um, cement eggs or non-block eggs. Um, and cement, again, like oak, is porous. 
but it's an even, um, I, I, I guess it's probably halfway between stainless steel and oak. So it's very, very, very limited amount of- Mega um, micro oxygenation. Yeah. Nano. Nano, 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 nano oxygen. Oxygen. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, uh, I can't help but just feel like this is very much like a design, a style over substance thing. You know, just to say that you've you've aged your wine in a, a concrete, concrete egg, egg. Like, it's quite common though, <laughs> isn't it? It's not like um, it's not it's not a style thing, is it? Just in loads and loads of them well, do it. To be it. fair, actually, answering my own question, does it tell you on the bottle that they do this? Not, Most places, mm, don't think so. Why? Not so, really. so how how would you know? How would you know? And why should you care? <laughs> no, it's what, I'm gonna, to, what I'm going to say. Like, basically, Dan, you've got to be a wine nerd. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So you've got you out. This is where the out. wine nerd thing comes in. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> but yeah, but it's getting. But again, this is one of the things that like gets me about the whole like wine world in general. Is there's lots of things that affect a wine, um, and lots of things that change. You know the way it tastes and everything else, and they just don't tell you. No, it like, is tricky. They choose not to tell you. It is. And, it, and, and, I guess, and I guess part of that is there's probably an element of surprise to it, you know, or, or they want you to have to sit there and sniff it and swirl it and be like, oh, yeah, what do you think? What, what do we think, guys? Is this, are, are we in egg territory here? Or, <laughs> oh, no, definitely tank, you know. I, I just think, like, why? why? Why not just tell me? Give me the facts. Well, I, I guess, like, do you need to know? I mean, we're talking about it now. But like, for example, like if this one of our wines just tasted a bit richer as a result of being in an egg or a barrel, we'd just go, this one's rich, isn't it? Oh, yeah, nice. We don't care if it's in an egg or a barrel. We're just going in. We're just no, going but a it would deep. be handy to know, wouldn't it? If you like Sauvignons that are a little bit richer. If you like and, eggy Sauvignons. And you know that, yeah. you know that being put in an egg <laughs> is going to give you that. Yeah. You're right. you know, when you're looking at the, the Isle of Waitrose, there's 16 Sauvignon Blancs where four of them have been in the egg, four of them have been in a barrel, and four of them are in stainless steel tanks. It would be good to know. Yeah, you're right. I don't know why they're so mysterious, Justin. What do you reckon? Well, I don't know that they are necessarily so mysterious. It depends how hard you want to... It depends how much trouble you want to go to to find out these things. I mean, most... I find now that most um, wines these days, if, if you want to find out a bit more information, they've all got websites. You can go in there... And if you want, a lot of them are quite helpful. They'll put on a tech sheet if you it's want to go work, that far. It is a lot of work. Like when you're, when, when you're, work. when, when you, I don't know about how you guys shop, but when you've got the list on your phone that either has been sent <laughs> I, like, I like a pen and paper list personally. I'm not a pen and I'm paper. I'm still old school. Well, the <laughs> fact that in notes you can now do tick boxes. Yeah, I prefer, like, I prefer and tick to it off, hold my list. Tick it off. Like, you know, food shopping for me is not a, it's not a leisure. It's not a leisurely exercise. So like it's a I'll, mission. Yeah, get in, so get it, out. Get it. I mean, all shopping for me is get in, get out. But like, yeah, I just I can't see myself going. I like the look of this, you know, mad fish. I'm gonna have a quick look on their website. Like, you just don't do it. No, no. true. But I guess that's why here at Smash Grapes we try to distill it down to to climate. And I, I'm I'm hoping Justin is going to agree that if you want to make smart decisions about wine buying and you're not buying something you know or familiar with getting down into the eggs and the barrels and that's probably that's that's a little bit too far down but starting with climate justin that's probably the first place to start isn't it the weather because that really is the big dictator yeah. of flavor before anything else it's the climate and the weather yeah that that basically sets the tone so you're absolutely right i mean we don't have to get bogged down in um in things like you know what the winemaker's done, you know, how many times he's shown it into a barrel or, or, or done whatever to it. You know, that's, this is for the, um, the geeks or the, uh, the snobs. It's not really, <laughs> relevant. Um, you know, if you raised the point there, the difference between a geek and a nerd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that. Mm -hmm. so we'll touch on that. <laughs> right, um, okay. Right. So with, I think we're going down a hole here. And uh, it's a good hole, but like I feel like it's it's yeah. like three AM wake up scrolling <laughs> Amazon Prime video. Like, what can I watch next? Yeah. Um, bottle number three. Our last, so the last suggestion. Um, this does yeah. not have Sauvignon Blanc talking about labels on the label, Justin. So what 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 have you what what have you got us here? I'm excited for this one because I've been looking at this on the shelf. Yeah. And I've been like, I'm going to have that soon, and so I'm excited that this is chosen. 
you've, I mean, I've seen it. I have seen mm. it, but yeah, I've never, I've never tried it. So talk us through number three, please. So I know, um, I know you guys like a bit of a curveball, and uh, I, I definitely wanted to throw something in a bit left of centre. Um, you know, the idea is we're trying to find something with that kind of refreshing, um, feel good factor, easy quaffing, um, fruity. Um, yeah, basically lip smacking kind of style. And um, for me, Grunefeld Lina is something that can do this. So we've basically, I've, I'm taking you now to Austria. Um, Grunefeld Lina is um, regarded uh, in terms of the kind of flavor profile is considered to have the similar kind of green, um, green fruits and, and the sort of vegetal style that you get with Sauvignon. So it's not a million miles away. But again, within uh, Gruner, you can get quite varying styles. And for me, so I- So let's just step, I, step that Gruner is a place. No, no, no. But Gruner is the grape. Okay, so, but, so when, when you're saying within Gruner, you mean like when you're drinking Gruner as the grape? Yeah, fine, okay. So yeah, yep. yeah, just to keep that in context. Um, um, so d d Gruner Veltliner, depending on where it's grown within Austria or around the world, because it's starting to catch on now, um, it's a great variety that is becoming very fashionable, um, albeit it's still at a very small scale. But, you know, we're now finding Gruner Veltliner in a supermarket. Um, this style for me shows um, something that's, again, it's got a nice balance. It's not too savoury. Um, it's got a really nice fruit profile. Um, it's got some nice ripeness to it. It's, it's kind of got that mix of what I consider green fruits and yellow fruits, so it's citrus. Um, but you also get those little kind of peach um, hints to it as well. And I just love the balance. And again, we're talking like natural, really refreshing acidity here. Um, there's, there's, it doesn't feel like anything's been kind of, um, it hasn't been messed around with basically. It, it feels as natural as, you know, grapes are fermented, bam, they've been um, Asian stainless steel and it's been bottled. Um, Larkin as well. Yeah. And where, do we pick, where do we pick this one up from? Aldi. This is an, this is an Aldi purchase. 49. I don't know about everyone else's Aldi, but there tends to be like, there's the racks, isn't there? And then there's the wooden crates. Yeah, they've got is, a little wooden crate section yeah. now. This, I've got a really old Audi. I don't have that, but you've got it. Yeah. yeah. Is this is this a wooden it's crate? It's not a wooden not. crater. No. It's not. They, a wooden they, crater. They're the they're the ones that occasionally push into a double digit Oof. for Audi. Oof. That's uh, you know that's, a, that's oh, yeah. a bold statement as well. I tend to find Justin. I don't know if you've noticed, but the wooden craters at places like Audi, they feel like they've just gone for a brand name, like, not even a brand name, a like very famous location like say Pouliffuise in Burgundy or something like that yeah. or Mon Pouligny Montrachat or something famous uh, like Chateauneuf de Pape and they know that that means that they can pop it on for 12 quid or 11 quid because people think oh that must be pricey because I've seen it pricey elsewhere mm. it's not an area that I would necessarily gravitate towards in Audi even as a wine fan I think the bargains are to be had at this end aren't they um, I'd say yes and no. Um, again, it depends what you look for. So um, I, I love having a good old look through my local Aldi. And you're right. I, you must have a particularly swanky Aldi up there, uh, Dan, because uh, I don't have any wooden crates in mine. It's all oh, metal. Yeah, all the, all the Aldis up here. You it's that Cheshire money. Yeah, you go, you go, <laughs> yeah. You go yeah. So you've got, you've got kind of your, you've got your normal racks, your, your normal rails, and then you've yeah. got like, wooden up, upturned wooden crates that it's have like a premium there's, section, yeah there's normally about yeah. four or six of them and and yeah they've got your your more premium bottles in mm. um i thought i saw this first off in the, but then at 649 it won't be in the premium. no it won't be in the no, premium definitely section. not but what but, i think audi do really well is like i would i would say steer away from the stuff that's like four to five quid because mm. they really have just gone lowest common denominator and it doesn't bode well for the wine. But yeah. in that six to eight pound mark, if you're not going for somewhere obvious like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, if you're yeah. going somewhere a bit left field, you just get really good value for money like yeah. in terms of the, the flavour. This is an absolute favourite of mine. I mean, I like Gruner anyway. I like Austrian Gruner. 
And I think for me, I, I would be a person that says I like high acid, racy, refreshing white wines. I mean, mm. I, you know, I like a Riesling, super cool climate Riesling, but it does have to be balanced out. It can't mm. be all acid burn. And for me, that's exactly what this delivers. Personally, I think better than the other, the other three. I just think it's, it, it's as Justin said, it's balanced. Yeah. It's refreshing, it is, it is but it's really, also really drinkable. Yeah, it is really nice. We've got a Gruner in from Funksteel, which is the mm. same part of Austria. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I did drink a bottle of that recently, and I did just think, wow, it's great. Like, it, obviously, it's the same grape, same region. It, it's not quite... It doesn't have the same... It's weird. Like, how would you describe it? oomph in a bottle of wine you know it's a bit mm. it, it this does feel a bit flat compared to that a bit more muted yeah a bit mm. more yeah. muted but yeah. not not quite the same kind of kick in the face but it, i mean it, yeah i think like when we were saying that you know it was nice but it wasn't 10 pound nice i would rather drink this one at the value than yeah. than, than than the other one inclined to agree but i think it delivers everything just as justin said everything that sauvignon blanc lover yeah uh, would enjoy and actually I think that's the case for quite a few cool climate grape varieties you said um, you were talking earlier Justin about aromatics those aromatic yeah. grape varieties like Bruna like Riesling they all deliver quite similar taste experiences to Sauvignon Blanc really don't they yeah I mean in, in terms of that kind of refreshing factor um, yeah um, the the actual kind of flavor components might be a little bit different but in terms of that you know being able to sort of knock it back and you know it's a really nice crisp dry refreshing style of wine um yeah all these varieties do it um pick pool the pina is another one yes um, that's another one which i like to recommend another one you can pick up for a bargain in tesco's yeah. especially through summer you got me onto that yeah. they did one it was about i think it was like i think it was nine down to seven or something like that Might be less than that yeah. it was it was in that kind of ballpark but that was they yeah. they had a it was a tesco's finest pick pool and that wow. did that kind of high high refreshing like racy yeah, yeah. these yeah. got really got me into that yeah yeah for sure for sure uh, and th these guys just in if I'm, I'm i'm really right and it's quite common in austria isn't it they're like what's called a cooperative aren't they where it's actually like loads of different growers on a boutique level coming together to make the one wine is that right yeah yeah so basically you'll have um one central um, uh, sellers, if you like, um, and you'll have a whole bunch of small holders who basically all look, produce their own fruit. Um, they'll follow, um, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a co-ops have basically have been around a long, long time. Um, and it's a great way for people to produce wine in a kind of communal situation um, where they don't have to invest in that huge cost of setting up a cellar and winery. Um, there are, there are very good co-ops and there are, you know, the kind of more mediocre co-ops, um, and the very good co-ops will often bring in a, a winemaker, a specific winemaker who's particularly talented in that, in that field of what they make. Um, and, and they'll all, all the growers will kind of follow a particular charter. Um, so, you know, they'll make sure that there's a consistency or a consistent theme across the way all of their fruit is produced. Um, and, and, and these guys are really, really good. You know, there are some fantastic co-ops making extremely affordable wine, um, you know, and there's some very good wine. I guess, I guess the supplier co-op, even, even a, a supermarket like Aldi, I mean, especially a supermarket like Aldi, unless, you know, unless you were dealing with someone like you know, booths or someone that's going to be like ultra premium. I guess you, you've got to be able to produce some volume. Yeah, you've got to be able you to probably, volume. probably be on yeah. the, the boutique volume that you mentioned before. I would imagine that, you know, anything that's on the shelf of an Asda shifts, you know, in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands across a year, which, you know, for one retail line is probably got to be quite yeah, it's a lot. Be, I think it's got to be hundreds of thousands. Owen, yeah. who works in the wholesale side of Smash Grapes, he sold some wine to Aldi once in his previous job, and I think it was hundreds of thousands. It was yeah. one yeah. Chile, it was a Chilean Carmen year. Just to, that's all he sold them in the deal, like linked the winemaker up with Aldi and mm -hmm. done the deal, and it was hundreds of thousands of bottles. Yeah, yeah, so, which has got to be, yeah, for a boutique, it's either all their output or like a cooperative, they get together 
and go, let's all, you know, let's all be out, let's all service this deal. But I guess you get the benefit of the boutique sort of care and attention, but at, but at scale, because then they can deliver that yeah. to, to a supermarket because there's lots of them clubbing together. Yeah. But again, but, does it tell you any of this on the label? <laughs> does it? balls? Do you know what I mean? Like, this is the yeah, stuff that yes, actually would, would be useful. Or you could tune in to your new favourite live stream slash podcast slash YouTube vlog. You could. You could. This is, and this is where Unbottled's going to come in. Yeah. What we're going to do is try and take all of this guff that they, that they don't tell you. Um, and, and we're yeah, telling them. Take it, get it we're out of the bottle. Them. Justin's bottle telling them. And Justin is going to impart he's, his knowledge he's onto, a service to onto the, the world free of charge. It's Absolutely. a winner for me, yeah, for sure. It, yeah, it, it is very good. It is good. I mean, to be fair, after we got a few of the Funk Steel kind of Austrian wines in, I, I, have, I have had a, a newfound love for, um, for these kind of wines. I've also recently found myself in quite a few kind of Bavarian bars over the last few months, like in, in Manchester, for example, where they have an Austrian and German wine list. So it's easy to get these kind of wines. And they're just, they are always a winner. They're always a crowd pleaser, especially if you like, it, it's, ex well, it comes right back to the start. If you're, what white wine should, oh, I normally drink a Sauvignon Blanc. Let's get the Gruner. And suddenly they're like, oh, this is great. I like, love it. So Well, I actually think for me, I don't often drink New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, if I'm going to be honest. But I do sometimes go around, I can think of a few friends, close friends that we might pop around for, for Sunday lunch or, or for drinks on a Friday night. And they're big New Zealand fans. So that'll be all that they've got in white wine wise. I actually get sort of acid fatigue mm. with that. It's so high in acid and so in your face that I, I don't think you can do it in quantities before it gets a bit too... I mean, Whereas I already reckon like that this, glass of Oyster Bay is going to wipe me up all night. Yeah, yeah, heartburn all yeah, night. All Whereas night. something like this, the balance means you just go all night on this. As soon as I got... As soon as the first card landed through my letterbox with 30 on it, there was a packet of Rennies at the bedside <laughs> table. And that's it, you know, and now I'm, that's my life now. Do you know what I mean? And, and an Oyster Bay is not going... Well, Rennie probably invest in Oyster Bay. <laughs> because, <laughs> keep, because, like, yeah, keep, keep them going, but... But yeah, this is high acid, but it doesn't burn. It's balanced. And that's yeah. what we started with, yeah. isn't it, Justin? Yeah. Like balance is what makes the wine drinkable, like at quantity where you can drink it all night and enjoy it if it's, if it's got that balance. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, you want to probably be drinking, most, most of us will probably be drinking these wines with food as well. I mean, I'm not really one for smashing loads of um, high acid white wines without eating anything because it will be a disaster. So, um, you know, invariably I'm going to be eating something with it as well. And if it's what really... are you eating? Go on then. Let's go, right, let's go yeah. through the lot, shall let's we? Let's go through. Oyster Bay, New Zealand, or any type of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, Justin, what would be your first pick? Um, mm. This was the acid burn, high acid. This was, yeah. The... I've got one for New Zealand, for, for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. I would probably, do you know what? I'd probably go for something spicy to try and knock that acidity yeah. back again. So I, I think, would agree. I think the idea of that Thai green curry actually is good. Yes. For, 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 for everybody else, that I had Thai green curry with my bottle, well, two thirds of a bottle of oyster early in the week. It worked very well, actually. And I, I Thai yeah. green curry is actually a bit mild for me, but the missus likes it. So I put a bit of hot sauce on mine and the, it was fine, actually. Uh, yeah. Vergelagen, what would you say, Justin, for a South African Sauvignon? Well, so this one's not quite as in your face, um, but it's got a bit more, uh, it feels like it's got a bit more body and a bit more weight to it. So um, I, don't, I don't know, I'd probably be going for some kind of um, some garlic prawns or something, you know, something quite simple, yeah. um, but quite flavoursome as well. Um, nice. nice. I, think that, I think they both bring the flavour out for each other. Very nice. The Australian, the Mad Fish, um, Mad Fish again. So this has got this has got a quite a bit of um, you know we picked up some nice intensity here. Mm. Um, so, ooh, what would I be going for with this? Um, maybe some nice goat's cheese or something like a goat's cheese tart or something like that. Could be you quite uh, good. you picked my favourite for Sauvignon Blanc, goat's cheese. Goat's cheese is actually quite high in acid. Well, all white cheeses, like your fetters and your ricottas, and much, are quite high in acid, aren't they? And so uh, yeah. any of those types of cheese, especially goat, the acidity is quite high in them. So that's one of my favourites for Sauvignon Blanc. And the Gruner? 
what would you say? Um, the Gruner, I think, the, again, the Gruner is a little bit softer, so it's probably got a bit more versatility to it. Um, I'd be probably going for um, maybe something sort of veg vegetable based. Um, like I like to bring in like the asparagus and stuff like this as well. Um, mm. You know, quite often we talk about... Not a single pork chop on this menu. <laughs> Are you disappointed I am, I that the am. pig has <laughs> not entered the menu? <laughs> the pig... The pig's made no appearance here. <laughs> I don't think you can have a pork Thai green curry. I don't think it... you could, I reckon. Well, maybe. Talking of Aldi, yeah. have you seen those um, like Chinese spiced pork chops at Aldi? Yes. I get those. I cut them into strips and then do them as a stir fry or a yeah. Thai green curry and stuff. So you, you could bring the pork in if you wanted okay. to. Yeah, I just feel like there's a <laughs> distinct <laughs> lack of pig on the menu <laughs> for my personal preference. That's that's all I'm saying. But but no, yeah, you know, I, I think. Lovely set of wines. Okay, um, so Oyster Bay Oyster was Bay ten pound, ten pound fifty. Vergelagen was at Co-op, and it was from South Africa. Vergelagen at Co-op and Tesco's was yeah. a tenner. Couldn't get it in our Tesco's though. Couldn't get it in our but Tesco's. It is in Tesco's. Tesco's. Yeah. The Madfish Sauvignon Blanc from Australia was seven quid with your club card. What was it without? I think, I think it it's um, I think it was nine quid. Nine. nine. Yeah, yeah. Nine, nine seems more right. Okay. Yeah. And then the Gruner Veltliner from Austria in Audi was six forty nine. What are you saying? Only because I think I've had better Gruner. Oh, I'm gonna go with the Madfish. Go in Madfish. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, uh, yeah. It's I like it. I like it. I could, yeah. I could, I could drink the rest of that, and I probably will drink the rest of that. Yeah, I enjoyed it, but for me, I am gonna go with the Gruner. Okay. I think it's a great example of Austrian Gruner, and uh, I could drink that all day. Justin, what are you saying? I'm, yeah, weirdly, I'm probably, I'm not really a big um, Sauvignon drinker, um, but I really like the Fergalagen. I know it's same kind of money as Oyster Bay, but that's that softer kind of style I really like, and I think it's, it's one that works really well with food. Um, so as I'm more of a food wine person, I'm probably going with Fergalagen. But I also even love that group. I love that group. even split, across even the board. split, even very split. nice. Well, look, love if you if you've managed to go and find any of these wines in the shops, um, and you know, give them a go yourselves. Drop us a little comment. Uh, let us know because we'd love to know which one was your favourite. Uh, Roger in the comment also had a Thai green curry for dinner. Very good taste, Roger. Good taste. Old Rog, he yeah, knows. He knows. He knows the himself. score. But, um, but what was he drinking with that, though? Was he drinking? Was he drinking? Now uh, he knows. A, a, now a, he a knows. Nice, a nice racy uh, southern. Drink. If you want to recap anything that we've talked about uh, this evening, guys, uh, then Justin's blog will be put up. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to put myself under pressure tomorrow. <laughs> You're doing it. Yeah, I'll put it up tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it up to Justin's blog, uh, which covers what Oyster Bay is and what it's about and the three wines he's chosen. We'll get that up on the site ASAP. Uh, we'll put a link in underneath the YouTube uh, video for this and yep. also uh, we'll link it into the podcast. Uh, what do they call the bit under a podcast? Comments? I don't know what they call it. Description? We'll put it in there. We'll put it in there as well. Dan's looking at me fearfully. I don't know how long it's going to take to get this podcast <sighs> listed. It'll down. happen. It'll happen. We'll put it in there as well. But otherwise, you can go to the site and uh, yeah. check out our latest blog and Justin's uh, picks for a uh, replacement for Oyster Bay or alternative to Oyster Bay will be up there. Great. And we'd also love to uh, hear from you. What kind of big wines do you pick up regularly from the supermarket? And would you like us to feature in the next one? Yeah, unbottled? let us know what you'd like to do next. Should we do red next? It makes sense to probably alternate. Go, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's oh, getting chilly as well. Are we bringing the rosé into this as well? We've uh, got... We'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we can. Uh, yeah, we'd love to love to hear from you as to what uh, what wine you'd like to feature, and ultimately, the reason you want a wine featured is because we want Justin to go and find us yes. some alternative. Really fantastic. That's the big thing. Um, if you've enjoyed this, go and follow Justin at Wine Nerd at the Wine Nerd. I mean, the wine, just the, the wine at the Wine Nerd. Go yep. follow Justin on Instagram. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Is that what like you do for YouTube? That's what, that's yeah. what if you're watching days. it on Facebook, please like follow. and follow. That's those things. Yeah. And if you're listening to the what do you do on a podcast? Subscribe. Subscribe. Please subscribe to the podcast. If you're listening to this, if you're listening to this on a podcast, we've recorded this before we've even known how, how to, to put, put a podcast, podcast out. So, <laughs> you know, thank you. Yes. Thank you for listening. I tell you what, if you're listening to this in the medium of a podcast, 
send us a message and we'll send you something to say thank you. Yeah, you can message us via the Smash Grapes website, which is smashgrapes.co.uk, and we will say thank you. You yeah. could be our first podcast listener. You could be. Who knows? Who knows? But yeah. Right. And, and put comments in. We want yeah. some comments, people. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right, well, thank you for joining. Say, so, Unbottled is going to be back at uh, a, a future date that we yeah. will announce. We've not quite decided exactly the frequency of these. No. Um, but that's, I think that's all part of the allure, isn't it? Yeah, who knows? when Because there could be another one tomorrow. There could be. There could be. It'd be a mystery. But, hey, uh, look, really, uh, really, really enjoyed doing this. It was good fun, actually. Mm. And thank I think, you, Justin. Yeah, thank you, Justin, for, for going Enjoy. out and finding uh, finding some alternatives to that Marlborough Sauvignon that so many people tell us is their, is their go-to. I mean, and I think they're the first to admit they're in a rut as well. I, I think, think so. I think New Zealand Sauvignon yep. drinkers are the first to admit they're in a rut. Well, hopefully they've got some alternatives. Exactly, now. exactly. Right, well, look, thanks a lot, Justin. Thanks for joining. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. But cheers and uh, have a good night. Cheers, guys. Happy Thursday. See cheers. you later. Bye-bye.